If the company called you back, the company sucks. If you could ski down the hill at 70 or 80 miles an hour and not be scared of making decisions then, you certainly are not afraid of taking risks. Our biggest issue is our brand is not Sequoia or General Atlantic. Welcome to the Smart Venture Podcast. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest from the Silicon Valley, where unicorns roam and innovation never sleeps. We've got top investors, superstar founders, and well-known tech executives lined up to share their secrets on building and investing in successful companies. Just a quick disclaimer, while we may sound like financial geniuses, but please don't mistake us for your friendly neighborhood financial advisors. So let's get started and dive into the wild world of tech entrepreneurship. Hi, Minchow. Thank you for coming on the show today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I've been looking at your journey as well as your fund, how your fund is structured. I thought it was really cool that you guys have Fortune 500 executives who invest in your fund. And then you guys also help the portfolio company to paired up or getting introduced to these LPs from these Fortune 500 companies. I thought it was really impressive. I learned more about how did you arrive at this point to where you are. So I saw that you work at Eastern Advisors and Bessemer and and uh, you've worked at UBS. Like, so before we start the show, I'd love for you to share with us, like how you got to where you are. Well, thank, thanks. First, thanks so much for having me on the show. Very much appreciate it. Let me give you a little bit of my background. So I, I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was actually a nationally ranked ski racer growing up. So everything I've learned in terms of like persistence and giving up and like, you know, um, not giving up and things like that came out of ski and, and like, you know, dogged, just insanely hard work came out of ski racing. I then went to Williams College, uh, which has a division one ski team. To be very clear, the only reason I got into Williams College is because I could ski race down the hill fast. Um, and then after Williams, I went to work at UBS Investor Bank. I wish I could tell you it was anything more than trying to find the highest paying job out of undergrad. And so that's why I ended up there. Um, very quickly, I realized I did not want to make PowerPoint presentations until four in the morning. And so, you know, I left. I'm pretty sure I was the wor worst analyst at, in the class. And uh, I did that for a I was there for a year. And then I joined um, Bessemer Venture Partners. Bessemer was a firm at the time, like a world stage, world class early stage venture fund, that at the time was very like Shark Tank esque. And what I mean by that is there were five partners on one side of the table and every year a thousand entrepreneurs would walk in the door and they would back five to 10 of them. They were good personal friends with the guys who ran Insight Venture Partners, which has since scaled to a gigantic fund. Um, and they were really, and they were start an Insight, when they would see deals that Insight did that they never saw. And they're like, why didn't we see these deals? They're both software companies and like similar type of things. And they realized that that Insight was hiring 22 to 24 year olds, kind of zero to two years out of college to like pound the phones, calling companies all day long to like, to really like find the next entrepreneur. It was find the company that was 15 of revenue growing 50% a year in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, or Lexington, Kentucky. All that Insight was doing was replicating what Summit and TA had done for a decade or 20 years before that, but only focused on software and internet. And we're talking timeframes here like 05 to 07. So I, I did that job at Bessemer. And when I got to Bessemer, my dad said to me, oh, you're one of these idiots. So my dad ran like a manufacturing company and would get called by tons of mid-market private equity firms that was going to like, it would tell him, oh, like I can help you in this way and that way. And he's thinking, how do I get your idiot, your idiot ass off the phone? And, 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 and so but what he said is like, you better figure out how to add value. So what I would do is if I was talking to the CEO of a $25 million revenue software company in Boston, and then I talked to another $25 million software company CEO. I might just like connect them together to be like, hey, you guys could like know each other. You might just like be able to learn things from one another. You're both bootstrap businesses or but maybe you're based in Chicago or Kentucky or wherever. So I would just like connect people together that I thought that would want to know each other. I wasn't invested in the company. I was just trying to like make friends with people. So I did that for a few years at Bessemer. And another rule we learned was if the company called you back, 
the company sucks. It's the CEO you call every two days for a month. That's the CEO you want to get on the phone. No different than if you work at like Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan out of undergrad and work in wealth management. They basically have you calling rich people. Rich people don't call you back. It's people that don't have money. They call you back. And so it's a game of like dogged persistence. And so again, ski racing, like don't give up, like, you know, call entrepreneurs every two days for two months until the best ones call you back. And I will tell you the amount of times that I have been told to like, you know, F off by an entrepreneur for being too persistent is literally maybe once or twice out of like 30,000 calls probably over my career that we've done or something crazy. And my firm has done way more than that. People appreciate persistence. Now you get, you get offered to be salespeople. Like people are like, I'll hire you on the spot. You're the most persistent person I've ever met. And so I did that. Uh, and then I went to, uh, and then I went to business school and then I went from there to join a hedge fund and spun out that I'm happy to continue the story, but I want to stop and see if you have any questions. Yeah, totally. I have so many questions. Like number one is like, what do you say to these CEOs? You're like, Hey, like I'm from Bessemer. I'm this guy, like I'm yeah. and you like, no, I, I, yeah. So it was actually pretty yeah. funny. Like, like, how, yeah. Hi, I'm Mitchell Green. By the way, we have now 18 to 20 associates who now email and cold call companies. Nobody leaves cold calls. Nobody leaves voice. So I'm like my the guys and the gals that we have now, I'm like, you guys don't get it. It is so easy now. When Brian and I were at Bessemer, Brian's one of my partners here. When we were at, when we were at Bessemer, we'd actually get the CEO on the phone. Like you'd be like, I'm, I'm a cold caller. Like I was, you know, somebody would cold call when you, 6 PM when you were sitting down for dinner, you know, 20 years ago, that was like me. So what do you do? Let's pretend you're the CEO of a software company that sells, that was Toast, Restaurant Point of Sales Systems Company, which we first invested in at Lead Edge at 25 or Revenue. But I might say to you, hey, I'm Grace. Great to meet you. Thanks so much for spending the time with me. We'd love if you have like three minutes to chat. Hey, I read, I've been doing a lot of, re, I work at Bessemer. We're this like world-class early stage venture fund. We've backed companies like Skype. We originally, you know, and, and Blue Nile and some other amazing businesses. We've been around for over a hundred years. We were part of like the Phipps family and Henry Phipps and Bessemer Steel. They, we, we came out of all that. We really partnered with entrepreneurs. I'm sure you're not looking for capital, but, but please, like we would love, I'm doing a lot of research on the restaurant point of sale system space. I've spoken to, I've spoken to Square. I've spoken to Clover. I've spoken to a bunch of other competitors. And like, every time I talk to people, your name keeps coming up. And like, it looks like you guys have 150 employees on LinkedIn or growing super fast and see that you're selling to like small, small restaurants. I'm sure like the, you know, and I think it's really smart by the way that you're, not you're able to like take software, give away the hardware for free and compete with these lousy idiots at like Micros and Aloha, which is NCR. The CEO is then like, wow, Bessemer sounds interesting. These guys are now like, this guy shows, seems like he knows some knowledge of my space. Sure, I'll talk to the guy for 10 minutes. So it's a really hard position to hire for because you need to find somebody who's like smart, can think on their feet, but can pry information out of people, but you just can't be salesy because you have to be able to understand the business and ask intelligent questions. And then in the future, come in and on the following Monday and like pitch it to the investment partners, but you need to engage the CEO in thoughtful questions. Does that make sense? You got on a call with these people and then how do you transfer that into investment? How many percent people convert, right? Oh. Like what does the converting process look like for you? Yeah, so for our firm, I'll just tell you what we are now. So we have these eight criteria that we focus on in investing in companies. And what are these like eight criteria? They are like, are you 10 million plus in revenue? Are you growing like 25% plus a year? Do you have like 65% gross margins? Are you capital efficient? I.e. are your revenues today greater than the amount of money you've burned since inception? Like, are you physically fit? The world is littered with 20 million hour companies that have burned hundred million to get there. Like they might be good companies. They're not efficient. Show me a company with 20 of revenue that's burned 3 million to get there. That's like a good, that's like an efficient business. Do you have any like customer concentration? You know, we have, and we have a couple more metrics. If you call a thousand companies, you'll find 1% that 
meet all eight criteria. And if our team speaks to about yeah, eight to 9,000 companies a year, that would mean that the pond of eight criteria deals would be 80 to 90 companies. That's too small a pond to fish in. You wouldn't like have enough hooks and bait to like get at five to seven deals out of it a year. So what we find is it's about a 10% yield if you take five or more criteria. And, and they're very subjective out of the eight criteria. It's like pick five or more, only do deals that meet five or more criteria. You get about a 10% yield. So if we speak to about 8,000 companies a year, eight to 9,000 companies a year, we talk to about eight to 900 of them that meet five or more criteria. To then do diligence in depth on about 150 to 180 of them. And that should result in a, in about five to seven deals a year. So if you think about it, we're talking to 9,000 companies a year to do five to seven deals. That's the pipeline. Okay, so let me recap on like your way of investing, right? So number one is like, you make a list of companies to call. Like, first of all, how do you find these companies? Is that from other investors or is that from you go deep on a particular sector, each of your 20 associates that like each person have some sort of sector they're focusing on and they're literally Googling what it's like. It's a, it, I wish I could, it's a boil the ocean approach. It's like a money ball approach to invest in. So uh, if you're looking for five or more of these eight criteria, they tend to be in like tech enabled serve. By the way, find me a manufacturing company that meets seven criteria, I'll invest in it. I don't think it exists. Find me a biotech company that met seven criteria, I'd invest in it. They're all zero criteria deals, which like isn't what we do. So then it's like kind of boil the ocean. So like, how do you find people? Well, one where there's smoke, there's fire. So if somebody finds a software company in the point of sale space that's growing fast, you then call, you then use Google app keywords and like Google and conference lists and wherever to call every competitor. Over the last decade, though, we've also built tools internally that help us um, look at huge amounts of LinkedIn data. So I can run screens on LinkedIn uh, across our own queries and databases to be like, okay, show me every employee, show me every company based in Utah that has over 100 employees that's growing their employee count 30% a year. Okay, like call the companies until they call you back. Now, how, why might you, you know, why do you use a hundred employees? Cause it's just like more likely to be like 10 million plus in revenue. Is that number 80 or 120? I, I don't know, but it's just like a cutoff. Okay. Then why are you looking at employee growth rates? Simple. There's only a couple of ways to hire employees, have a profitable business, have a VC or have a rich uncle. Uh, and you obviously can't screen for rich uncle, but in the, where you see, companies growing really fast in the absence of capital raised, like those are the companies to go after like tigers. Okay. So, and then basically you find a company that meets your criteria and then you go after their competitors by like ripping up like a conference list or something. And then you're just like, you're trying to canvas the whole space. There is no database that contains the information on these companies. And so you're like, I need to go figure out what companies to call. I need to go, go build relationships with those companies. I need to have something that's why they want to talk to me. So my pitch now is, look, talk to us. And if we invest in your business, we will give you access to our LPs. Our LPs run, built, and advise some of the world's largest companies. And if you go to our website under network, probably 80 to 90% of our LPs are mentioned. Like, tell me who you want to meet. And oh, by the way, in the diligence process, you're going to meet people. And so, uh, and so that, that, that's our, like, you have to have a reason to why, why a company wants to talk to you. And we can say, listen, okay, you are a software company that sells software to the, re to, to the biotech or pharmaceutical industries. How would you like to meet the former CEO of Biogen? How would you like to meet the former CEO of Pfizer? How would you like to meet, you know, a board member of Merck? Oh, you sell into the retail space. How would you want to meet, you know, the, the, the CEO of Target? And by the way, we're only offering that if the company is like killing it and growing super fast. Oh, by the way, you need like a female audit chair. Let us email our 700 LPs and we'll ask them if they know this is a $50 million revenue company in Salt Lake City. Like we'll get you female audit chair candidates. Hey, you're a $100 million revenue company going to 300. We could introduce you to a bunch of people who have built businesses like that. 
And we tell all our LPs, don't invest in our fund unless you want to help. How do I convert them into LPs? So what I would say is you just ask them. And like, I mean, for us, it's just been about, we, we get a group of people. We tell them, if you invest in our fund, we want you to help. So like, if you, if you, if you only want to invest and you don't want to help, we don't want your money. I'll just go get another, I'll, I'll, I'll just get somebody else that wants to help. Now it's not like, remember when you have a lot of them, nobody's helping that much, but like we are experts in software and tech enabled services. I can't be an expert on every sector. So we regularly, when we meet a company, we say to them, Hey, would you want to, you know, for a company, it's awesome. They might want to meet, you know, the former CEO of XYZ in this company of an industry. But then we ask the CEO, like, what'd you think? You know more about the space. The CEO, the former CEO of Pfizer knows more about the pharmaceutical space than Mitchell Green and the entire firm of Lead Edge know collectively combined about, pharma about pharmaceuticals. So, so you're running a $5 billion fund. Like, how do you raise it? I know that you worked at like Eastern Advisor, which is built onto like Tiger Global. And like, number one, it's like, how do you convince someone like that to hire you? Like, and then number two is like, okay, after they hire you, how do you convert that into your own fund? Because like later on, you started your, your sure. own, fund. like what kind of track record did you have before you yeah. started? And then yeah, yeah, I'll give, I'll, I'll give you a story. I'll take this couple of minutes. So how did I get hired? I believe that most people don't know how to look for jobs. I believe, where'd you go to college? Uh, University of Illinois, I've been a champagne. Okay, so that means you know how to that means you know how to bust your ass off and look for jobs. So like I actually, I thought you were gonna tell me you went to like Princeton, and I would have told you if you went to Princeton or if you went to Williams or if you went to Harvard or all these other schools, like life comes on a platter. And so what does that mean? You come out, you go to the career counseling office, you get your internship. Your internship at McKinsey leads into a job at McKinsey. You then end up at Harvard. You then apply to five business schools. You get to go into a top five business school. You then like get a job at, um, at, you know, at a private equity firm or a venture capital fund, not a business school or a, doing something else. And like life was on platters. Yeah, that's not how I believe it. Like life works at all. That's not what happened to me. Like I've always, I've never had much more than a 3.0 GPA. I've had ADD since I was a little kid. I'm like the hardest worker on the planet because of it. I, I'm not nearly as smart as anybody in this industry, but I'll outwork anybody. So what I did when I start, when I got to business school, I built a list. I built a list of every hedge fund in the United States that did tech invested. I then figured, used the alumni network at Williams and my own network to figure out who I knew that knew people. I was able to, through a family friend, get introduced to it who lived in New York City. I grew up in Michigan who like grew up in New York City, introduced me to a guy he knew that knew somebody else who worked at Eastern Advisors. I went in and convinced those guys to hire me for the summer. I'm pretty sure I did it because the guy who hired me, this guy named Scott Booth, uh, would later tell me, if you could ski down the hill at 70 or 80 miles an hour and not be scared of making decisions then, you certainly are not afraid of taking risk and calculated risk. And I want people that when the stock market's down 25% are going to come running into my office, pounding on something to buy X, Y, Z. So it's just like he wanted somebody that was a risk taker that took calculated risks. I get to the hedge fund. I convince him to do a couple of private investments. Then because the world basically blew up in the fall of 08, early 09, I ended up buying the investments out of the fund. I raised the money, like $10 million from every person I'd ever cold called. So like if you were the CEO of XYZ company when I was at Bessemer cold calling you and, I, and you had been like built a big company, I called you and I'm like, hey, we haven't spoken for a year and a half. I'm raising this like single purpose vehicle. Like, would you want to invest? If you were in my class at business school and I think your dad was rich, I probably asked you if you wanted to invest. And so I raised 10 million bucks. That 10, we bought more Bizarre Voice stock. We hustled, we bought more and more. I think we ended up with like, I don't know, 15 to 20, generated a few years later, a great return. I did two SPVs. Uh, and then what I did is every every time I would get like updates on Bizarre Voice, I'd send it to my LPs. I'd be like, look, you're invested in me in my little SPV, but you're really invested in Bizarre Voice. So I'm going to send you every quarter the financials on Bizarre Voice. They know exactly what's going on, good or bad. And then I'm going to also ask you for help. So if I'm, I'm going to say, hey, Bizarre Voice needs an introduction to... GE, Pepsi, the NFL, whatever. Can you help? People respond. 
And then they would see a quarter later that something signed it turned into a customer. So then I did it, I did a couple SPVs. And then a bunch of my LPs were like, stop doing deal, deal by deal, like raise a fund. And so I then like raised a $50 million fund. And I will tell you that almost all the investors who are either alive or not divorced, you know, the vast majority of them are in fund six, which is $2 billion that were in fund one. And every LP we've met is through one another. So like, why are you not a six and Z now? Like, so it sounds like you, it sounds like you already built up this network and then you just need the cloud. Like what's the difference between you and them in your oh, mind? One, one way I've in two very different types of businesses. So like I invest in, you know, 75% of our current portfolio is in super profitable businesses. You know, they're, they're early stage investors, which is obviously a different business. No, two, when Mark and Jason started, Mark and Jason was rich. Mark and Jason was famous. I'm like, I'm like a nobody. Like I, you know, I was like some 26 year old, 27 year old kid at Ward Business School starting this thing. So like these, these, a lot of these guys just had huge head starts on us. You know, for, for us, it's about trying to build, like we're really young. I'm 42. The three of us who run the firm, I'm 42. I founded the firm. The guy I brought on to start had been at Best, had been at Insight. I met him from somebody at Bessemer, a guy named Nime. He's 35. He's been a partner here since day one. Or, partner since the end of fun one. And my third partner, Brian, we were the first two cold callers at Bessemer. He's 42 too. We want to do this for the next 25 years. Like we can build, we think an incredible organization, but like we, th those guys just had 20 year head starts on us. Cause like I wasn't famous when I, I was, when I started lead edge, I was broke. Like I had like, you know, more debt than income. Um. Okay. So basically you were saying like you were, you started the $10 million fund by just cold calling everybody you knew. And then by that time, like, did you already have a track record or like, how do you kind of. So I didn't even have a fund because my first vehicle was buying the Bizarre Voice state. And I was like, I have a company. I'm investing in it. I'm buying actually the hedge fund that I spun out of, out of, because it, it was down a bunch and needed liquidity. Do you want to invest? Here's what the company does. I have zero track record. I'm like a persistent SOB. Like, um, do you want in? So I did, I basically did two of those deals. And then we raised our first fund with absolutely no track record. Like it was just, but, but again, all of those LPs that were in those deals, like loved how we got, we were helping the companies, like asking them for help. All these people like invest in things and they never get asked for help. Put it another way. Say you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to use somebody that's not an LP. So it's like, say you're like the CEO of Procter and Gamble. He's not an LP. Don't know the guy never been in my life. My guess is that guy is worth 75 million bucks. Probably. Maybe not even that. 70 million bucks. The 70 million bucks is managed at Goldman Sachs. 20 is probably in real estate. So he's got 50 left. 40 of 50 is in stocks and bonds. Microsoft, Adobe, Procter & Gamble, whatever. 10 million is in alternatives. Venture capital, private equity, you know, all these different things. And you know and you know what funds Goldman Sachs has them in? Probably to no, to no fault of their own. KKR, Goldman Fund. Blackstone, Apollo, Aries, that investor is investing in a Goldman wrapper to invest in those funds. He knows nothing really about those funds. They don't even know who he is because he's in through some Goldman wrapper that invests in the fund. And he gets a statement every quarter and it's like it. He, it might as well be Procter, Nike, and Pepsi that they've, he's invested in versus Blackstone, KKR, and Aries. We come along, and so that's like, there's no engagement with him. We come along, we meet him through his, a friend. He then probably looks at the website and notices he, he knows five other people because at the top of all these industries and wealthy people, like or VCs, like everybody knows one another. It's not that small a world. Like, so then, so then we were like, we meet him through a friend and then, you know, they see our track record, the friends speak to him. And then we say, listen, if you invest in our fund, we want you to help. So every quarter, we're going to send you emails asking for help. We're going to send you, we're going to send you like, we're going to like walk you through our portfolio and tell you what we own. Good, bad. How are things doing? Whatever. It's just like a level of engagement that that person doesn't get from anybody else. And so like, that's how we have built this entire thing. It's, it's customer service. It's like treat people like you yourself would want to be treated. Thank you for sharing with me. Oh my God. That's like a pretty real pitch. Okay. So you guys have like 18 people or like 20 associates or, or someone like calling, cold calling, right? Yep. What does like the rest look like 
from your firm since you have like a talent network like or whatever you call it like the LP network like how is your firm like overall structured and how like why do you structure it that way yeah so we obviously have investment team on one side operations team on another side on the investment team there would be seven or eight partners that each do deals we would have uh and there's three of us who kind of run the place that we've been here since fun one there's seven or eight of us that have um th th that do deals that partners below that there are two principals that have been here for call it five to eight years below that there would be a couple of vps two or three VPs. I think most of them have been here. They started when they were like out of undergrad. And then we have, you know, associates, analysts, associates, and senior associates. Analysts and associates, there's like a title inflation. So they're effectively all the same thing. Um, some of them are just slightly older than the others. Um, senior associates, once you've been an associate for a couple of years, you become that. Um, but that, that whole group of people, which is like 18 to 20 people are all cold calling companies. So that's like the investment team. On the operations side, you know, we have CFO, a controller, a head of compliance, a head of events, a head of PR comms. And then we also have a value creation team, which we, which consists of six operating partners. Um, like one of our operating partners was the former president of eBay, CEO of Intuit. One was the former president of Dell. One was the head of sales and chief revenue officer of Duo Security from like 5 million to 500 million or something crazy like that. But that company was backed by Benchmark and True and Google and Meritech, yet he joined Lead Edge because he, he knew the power of our network. So we have like six of these operating partners in the value add creation team. And then we have like, like three other people uh, on value add. One of them was at Vista Equity Partners. She runs the value creation team. Um, one of them runs Talent. He was at Bridgewater for many years uh, and then did a startup. And then one of them is like a consultant to them, like has a Bain McKinsey type background, so can and then one of them is it does internal type presentations and stuff for us. But that team, so what might happen is say you're the CEO of one of our companies and you have a go-to-market question or issue, we can bring in Jim Sib, who ran sales at Duo. We would then loop in Avra, who would run point on it. And then we would bring in the consultant junior to like run all the analytics on it. And like the three of them would go at it. Now, maybe there's something that we didn't have expertise in where we needed to pull in an LP. We could bring in an LP as well. Or maybe the request is, hey, I just need an intro to these 10 companies. Do you know anybody? You know, there can be different ways you engage the LPs or operating partners. Like, who do you consider as your competitors? And like, you mentioned you invest in like a company that's like your first deal. Like you basically started SPV asking all these people to join. Like, what company would be today's equivalent? It's not going to be like, they all invested in like uh, OpenAI or something or like, what? No, 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 no. So like, I don't know. A, a, I mean, a typical company that would have 10 or 20 million of revenues growing 40 to 100 percent a year. But that would be that, 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 that those would be examples of, um, of of the types of companies. Who do we consider our competitors? It depends on the type of deal we're doing. On one hand, if it's a Silicon Valley based company, that's probably hyper growth, which is a part of what we do. Probably like a third of what we do would be Meritech, IVP. Sequoia's growth fund, Excel the growth fund, Battery Ventures when they do growth, Bessemer when they do growth, Iconic. Um, that would be like bucket one. But then we also, you know, we buy companies as well and control transactions. And those would be, you know, you might see Serent Capital, True Wind, LLR, FTV, uh, or for more like even slower, just slower growth minority stuff too. Uh, would be those types of people. Yeah, but again, it all starts with the eight criteria. Everything goes through that. And then it's just the type of company it is might attract different competition. What is like everybody's KPI at your firm? Or like, how do you like kind of like do the annual planning stuff too? And then how do you manage this many associates, like a different like type yeah, of- Yeah, so, yeah. So um, of the seven partners, one of our partners does only public stuff and has a team. Five of our partners all basically have pods as well as, you know, three to five analysts slash associates. The analysts slash associates are on the front run, on the front uh, lines, like pounding the phones or e really emails now, reaching out to companies. And then it just gets processed above that. The KPI, though, look, we get a report every week 
where we know the, the 20 associates, like how many good co's did you talk to? Because by the way, I can get lots of calls if I call crap co's. If I like call companies that have no revenues are not a fit for us. Like if I call startups all day long, I could have 50 calls with companies, but it's not going to be relevant to us because that's not what we invest in. What we find is that an associate needs to have about 10 calls a week in order to bring a couple like one or two good co's to pipe the following week. And so like, you know, they should bring in a hundred good co's a year, 75 to a hundred good co's a year uh, to pipeline. It'd be 50 to hundred good co's a year to pipeline. Now, not every company they bring to pipeline will be a good co, but in, so, you know, if I guess the way, way, way to think about it is if, if you have 20 associates and they bring two companies each to pipeline every year, every week, you know, over. And then if you assume there's two companies brought to pipeline by every by 20 people. So there's 40 of them every week being brought 40 companies a week. Let's say half of them are, are good enough to make the cut that we would be like, that's a good code. Let's like chase after it. So they're bringing basically like their, their goal is to find like 50 great companies a year that, that to invest with us. Maybe it's slightly higher. And again, so how do you get two good calls a week, one to two good calls a week out of 10 calls? You got to reach out to probably send 200 emails a week. So we literally get a report every week with like every associate on it with the number of, you know, like emails they sent, email emails received, number of phone calls. Like it, you run it like a call center. Do you give them a script or like some sort of template that for this kind of stuff? What are, what like number oh, you one? Mean that you mean that they're like, I mean, regularly at best, some CEOs would say to me, not regularly, they would say, how are you going to help me? You're like 22 years old. I'm looking at your picture on the website. I'd be like, oh, no, no, no. It's the firm. I'm just on the front line. No, we have like robust training for them. You know, you, when people join here, it's a two to three year job at the analyst associate level. And we put people through a month of training, like very intensive training, financial modeling training, you know, like pitching lead edge training, understanding our LPs training, perfecting your script training, what to look for in a company, analyzing a company. It's like, I would actually say that I would credit my partner, Nime and my partners, Nime and Brian with our head of HR, like building a very robust training program. And I will tell you that the associates who join here now and analysts are trained 20 times better or a hundred times better than those who started 10 years ago because we didn't really have a training program. It was kind of just like sink or swim. So why don't they just like piece out? Like, let's say like after I work for you for two years and then I just go out and then build like a competitor, like what's like your way to like make them stay? Or well, like the reality is this, for most of our associates who join and analysts, it is a two to three year job. We don't promote that many people. It's hard to be promoted. Was it easier to be promoted if you were the first analyst at Lead Edge Capital? Of course. Uh, I'm not worried about anybody replicating this place. Like, good luck. Um, but no, I mean, like, we, we're we excited. We get excited when, like, you know, we have an associate who's been here for two or three years, and it's not going to be a fit for us. Like, one of our associates is, mo is moving to Boston because of family-related things and is going to work at TA. Like, that's great. Wonderful. Like the, the more, the more lead edge alums work at awesome firms, the better we can recruit great people. How do you recruit these people? Just like based on like a resume or like, oh, they work at blah, blah, blah firm before. Or like, how do you kind of like. We usually are, look, we, we have, we have a split between people zero to two years out of school. A lot of it's undergrad recruiting. I mean, look for people that have the same kind of like skill sets that we have. Smart athletes are like is is a great are smart entrepreneurs and by the way it can be failed entrepreneur it doesn't matter I start a cookie store in 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 college and sell cookies and sell a lot of cookies whatever that's fine it's just do something entrepreneurial like it's not there, there are there are too many people that are really smart like smart people are not always good at this job. You can like overthink things too. I guess like, how do you like make them, I guess like you already mentioned about the training program, but like if I were like the CEO, like you call me and then like ask for my numbers for like all these, the eight criteria that you just mentioned, I will be like, uh, get away from me and then hop. Like, how do you make sure that they gave you the actual information? It's a dialogue. It's just like, there's no magic formula. It's a dialogue. Have a dialogue with somebody on the phone and that CEO needs to respect you and think you're really smart and you can have like a conversation with somebody on his on their business. Like that's and by the way, if you've spoken to every restaurant point of sale systems competitor, 
you can have a really intellect, you can have a really good dialogue with them. The phone. You're not sharing anything about, by the way, you're probably, you're not sharing anything on the phone with anybody that you wouldn't get on the internet. Like you're not telling somebody, some CEO about what some other CEO told you about things like that. It's like stuff you could read in press releases, but you're just smart. You ask smart, thoughtful questions that show that you understand the industry. I think that's how you get respect. Who do you consider as your personal board of advisors? And like, how do you kind of like maintain your relationship with them? RLPs, the people that we run money for are like all, all like people that we like look up to. How do you know, like how to build your current business? Is this just I, like- I don't, I actually have no clue what I'm doing. I'm being honest. <laughs> I, don't. I mean, it, it's not too bad to run a $5 billion fund and not, not sure what you're doing. So No, like, I mean, I, I know what I'm doing. I've got, we have the investment process down to a T. We know exactly what we're looking for. We know exactly how to make investments. Like we know what fits our bricks parameters and does not. But I, you know, you know, you know what the biggest company I run is one with seventy one employees, Lead Edge Capital. I've never run a company with one hundred and fifty employees. So I try to surround myself by smart people that have done it before. Other guys that are gals that run funds, whether it's private equity funds or hedge funds, whatever. Ask a lot of questions. Hire people smarter than you, build a culture of like being flat. So for instance, every year I spend three days interviewing every one of our employees. I ask them like, what do you like about working here? What do you not like about working here? What are three things you would change? And if you were me, what would you do differently? You learn a lot. I mean, some of it is like crazy. It's like my chair is uncomfortable. And if I had a more comfortable chair, I'd work better. It's like, you know, waited for me to ask you that? What? Or like my laptop is too slow. It's like, then get a new laptop, you know? Or like, by the way, we have no, like, and so we hired a head of communications out of feedback that came out of all the analysts being like, people in the Bay Area now know who we are, but people in Indianapolis have no clue. So we're like, okay, let's go hire somebody to help fix that. So we, uh, we hired Michaela, who just joined. Who do you like idolize? Like as like a fund that you're trying to emulate? Who do I respect? I don't think I would idolize anybody, but I respect the guys at General Atlantic a lot. I think they've built like I think they've built a tremendous investment engine that has like very consistent return. Where you're not gonna like lose. If, but you invest in GA, you will generate like solid eddy returns. Might you be able to get better returns elsewhere? Yes. But those with better returns elsewhere, there's a probability you don't have a higher likelihood of bad returns at some point. I think like the guys at GA just like do it the right way, are super thoughtful. They've built a big scalable organization, do it across lots of different sectors. Do really, I've seen the type of diligence they do on companies. They will give companies proctology exams. And so I, I think they're good investors. Where are the last one minute fire round? Number one, what's your favorite book? Don't have time to read. Who would you invite to a dinner party? Lewis Hamilton. Who made the biggest impact in your career? My dad. And Jeremy Levine of Bessemer. Okay, where can we find you outside of work? Ski racing, port, kids horse shows, or, or, or in a race car track. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. For sure. Thanks for tuning into Smart Venture Podcast. If you learned something from the episode or even just mildly tolerated me, please subscribe and leave a five-star rating. I promise I will keep bringing you more successful, insightful interviews and insider tips about startups. Remember, sharing is caring. So tell your friends who listen too or enemies, I won't judge. Until next time, keep venturing smartly.